My name is Paul Mitchell. I'm a professor in agriculture and applied economics here at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And in this little short video clip, I'm going to redo a talk I gave at Wisconsin um, Energy Institute's Advancing Wisconsin's Rural Bioeconomy. Uh, my talk was called Wisconsin Changing Rural Landscape. Um, what I'm going to do is overview the um, food supply chain in Wisconsin to get a sense of where farmers and the rural landscape fit in and then talk about how farmers are doing in general. And overall, the idea is to um, talk about the potential for Wisconsin's bioeconomy to set the stage for other people to do all those kind of things. Um, beginning here is a, sort of an overview of the last 10 years of how much revenue farmers are generating. This would be cash receipts, money they're getting from the things they sell. You can see in the last four or five years, it's been about $11 million, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. And most of that, about 65, 70% is livestock. Really, dairy dominates and beef cattle are, are the other major ones, so cows. Um, and then the crops are the other 30, 35%. And most of that's grains and um, oil seeds, corn and soybean. Um, but then there's a chunk there in vegetables and fruit. And I've spoken about this in other situations. Um, looking at it as a pie chart, you'll see here, you got milk and um, cattle and calves. That's a big chunk of it there, corn and soybeans. But notice these other... Sm small amounts of livestock, other livestock, you know, eggs, poultry, hogs are in there, um, other livestock, most likely goats and sheep. Then in our, here's our vegetables and such. Um, we've got, you know, hay, obviously, for the cattle. But there's a large chunk of this other that's even beyond these small ones. It's just, there's a lot of diversity out there in what we grow here in Wisconsin among our farmers, not just cranberries, um, our you know, number one fruit crop, or potatoes, our number one vegetable crop. Um, globally important in both of those. Here's the, where they spend the money. They spend about $10 billion. So they're getting roughly $11 billion and they're spending roughly $10 billion. And it's a wide variety of things um, to get a sense of their economic impact. Feed for all the livestock. Um, another almost 14% of these farm services. That's a wide range of activities. Things like veterinary services, accounting, um, insurance services, uh, consultants of various kinds to do you know, nutrient management planning, things like that. It's, it's a wide range of um, those kinds of services that you would buy, labor, self out on the farm. There's a lot of people that work, uh, farmers hire a lot of people to work on the farm. Um, supplies for like re, um, repairs and construction, you know, building things. Um, and they get your fertilizer and, and chemicals, machinery, energy, um, interest um, on their, um, any operating loans or loans they have, things like that. And then you can go all the way down into, you know, rent to the land and such like that. So you can see their economic impact is large and they have, a, there's labor and there's a lot of services they buy, not just inputs are buying, but people, um, people's um, professional skills. So now looking at the food supply chain, you go from the input supplier to the farmer um, and on down the, the line there, that's what's kind of laid out here on the right side of this um, figure. Um, and ag business is the input supply, then you got farm production, food processing, packaging, transportation, wholesale, um, retail, and food services, and then you got some of the other major sectors, energy, um, as well as you know, finance and advertising, legal and accounting and such. And it's looking at that full supply chain when you get to the end at the consumer, how much of that value is generated, generated along that line from, from the beginning to the end, where along that um, chain is that value generated? Um, so at the final end there, you, how much, it's almost 10% is on farm production, not quite 9.7. Um, and then you go all the way up to the large one being that the food retail, um, either the restaurant and the food service side or the retail trade and grocery stores primarily. Um, and then the other one, you know, processing is almost um, 16%. Um, and then people after processing, pro um, packaging and transportation. Um, the retail though is a major chunk of it there, either at the directly to the grocery chains or um, particularly in the restaurants. So you can see a lot of that value is generated post farm gate. And then when they get that value, so it's like um, have that income, they generate the surplus, where, do they, where does it go? Um, we're gonna look at um, four areas can go into labor and capital, you know, paying people to work or the owners of the, the very various um, machinery, the equipment, the land used to do it. And then there's also some goes to taxes. Um, and then the, uh, in this figure, yellow will be imports, meaning they, it, go, it leaves the system, go, it's somewhere out of the country. And what you can see quickly here, it's the same supply chain across the bottom from the input supply, ag businesses, farmers, all the way down to the legal and accounting at the far right. And what you see, we'll look at the farm production. It's the most capitalized one along the whole line there. That brown is very large there. That means when the farmers make money, where does it go? It's paying the land as the primary capital resource. Um, there's machinery and buildings as well, but land is a big one. Um, the black 
um, is the, the the taxes, and where you see those are large is in that wholesale wholesalers, retailers, and food services. That's that's where there's a lot of um, uh, taxes generated in the rural economy. Um, these those people on those lines, um, and then the blue is the labor income. Um, you can see there's a lot of sectors, a lot of the sectors along there that generate a lot of labor income. Um, all the the various parts of the supply chain, most of them. Farming's actually uses much less. When they make money, it goes primarily to paying for the capital. Um, where you go somewhere like the retailers, it's a big chunk is labor and then um, and some capital, obviously, and then the um, in, um, taxes. So um, switching gears a little bit here, this is from Steve Deller's report, um, Contributions of Agriculture to the Wisconsin Economy. And this is, he comes up with this big number, $105 billion. And that, that's the full multiplier effect with the indirect and induced effects um, that, you know, when farmers, they have to buy inputs and um, that they hire people and that, that knows people then um, do things, buy other things and spend money. And so what they come up with is about 20% of the 105 billion is the direct on-farm activity, 22 billion, 4% of the jobs, 3% of the income in the state. But most of it happens, almost 80% is in the processing, the post-farm gate activities, um, where 8% of the jobs in the state, 9% of the state's income is. And that shows you what I'm after there is sort of that effect that the farms are obviously important, there's a lot of stuff that happens after the farm that's where it generates that larger impact. Um, and then separating out dairy from the overall pile, um, it, both the on-farm and the processing is almost um, you know, 46 billion, a little less than half, um, the whole dairy industry alone. So there's a lot of other activities as well, but obviously dairy is our most important agricultural sector. So now we're gonna look at food processing. And this map here is as well from Steve Deller's shop. Um, and what you see here is this is the number of food processing businesses in each county across the nation um, in 2016. And a lot of them are in the urban areas, which makes sense. You know, example there, look at Texas. You can see Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, um, San Antonio, Houston making the big triangle. Obviously, look at California. You see the uh, Los Angeles in the Bay Area. You see Salt, Salt Lake City. You see Denver. You see um, Phoenix show up. Um, you go on the East Coast. You see, you know, the big Boston down to New York City and on. They see in Florida, you see the same thing. Which makes sense. You put the, the processing where the people are. But the one that stands out, I really want to focus in on, is the along Lake Michigan there. You start over, start over there in southwestern Michigan, go down around the lake through Indiana, up through Chicago, and then hit Wisconsin. It goes along the lake there, and then it slowly goes inland on its way kind of to almost reaches to um, contiguously to um, Minneapolis, St. Paul. It, that's unusual in the sense that there's a lot of food processing there where there's not a lot of people. You really look on the map, there's not a lot of areas that have that large of a contiguous group of food processing that are not associated with a large number of people. You know, the Chicago area obviously is a large city in the U.S., but it, it, it doesn't have as much of the food processing. Uh, that many people doesn't generate as much of that big footprint you see there in that area. And the point I'm trying to make is that that area of the country is, has an, a higher than typical number of food processing facilities in those counties. And that's unusual on that map. Um, what are they? You can see the pictures, but you know, Wisconsin's number one in cheese production, so you see a lot of dairy processing. Um, you see meats and stuff, bakeries are common, that's everywhere. But the other one you see is we're number two in vegetable processing. So this fruit and vegetable, um, and especially food manufacturing is there. That's what these factories are um, here in Wisconsin. So you can kind of see we have a large sector here of food processing. So we have a diverse agricultural sector, lots of different kinds of things we grow here. Um, livestock and um, crops, food manufacturing, and re in reality, manufacturing in general are um, important in the state um, relative to the rest of the country. We have a higher concentration than typical, particularly in these, some of these rural areas. It's, it's around the state, but you can see it's higher than typical in most rural areas. And then farms are obviously important, but most of that economic impact of agriculture is generated um, after the farm. That's the income, the jobs, and the tax base. So you can see that's, that's, and so that's important for the bioeconomy. We have a lot of that here to read. We are used to moving large amounts of biomass, some um, crops or livestock through this system and doing things with it. So I think we can also work in a bioeconomy, which is more circular. So let's look, now let's look directly at the farm sector. How is it doing? So first off, when we talk about farmers, I, I really like to emphasize who, who do you mean? So this is the number of farms in Wisconsin by the sales they do, the amount of sales they have, and then the percent in each category there. USDA goes all the way down to anyone selling $1,000 worth of agricultural commodities as a farmer under their definitions. 
Well, you can see most Wisconsin farmers in that categorization are selling less than $100,000 worth of um, agricultural products. That's not a lot. of. Uh, if you think of a profit margin, say 10%, 15%, that's $10,000, $20,000 if you get up to 20%. That's not, that's not enough money to live on for most people. You, you need more of a family. You're going to need more money than that. And so what I really like to focus in on is that sector, the, the small part up on top is really where the activity is in farming in terms of production. The, those last two groups, that three and four percent, that's roughly a little over 5,000 people. You go down to the, all the way down to the, um, the 250,000 and up, that's um, about 9,000 farmers here in the state of Wisconsin. So that's who I mean when we talk about farmers. Uh, this is some national data that show the same thing and it breaks out that, that large category of um, small farms in terms of sales. Um, you can see there's about 10% are these larger scale operations, at least $350,000 in gross sales and up. But you break down that small category and that 90% of farms in the nation, who are they? Well, 18% of farms in the U.S. are retirement farms. That's why they fall in that small category. Um, off-farm occupation farms, 42% of farms in the U.S. are off-farm occupation farms. That means they have another job that they consider their main job and they farm as sort of a hobby on the side. Then you have people who say they're farmers and they have, some of them are very low sales, less than $150,000 in gross sales. Again, that's not very much money. If that's your primary income and your primary job and you're living off the, the net from that $150,000 and below of sales, that's, you're, that's, you're very poor um, relative to the most household income measures. Moderate sales is also there at about 5%. So 25% in that low sales category and most of those people would fall into the rural poor, working poor, and they most likely have other sources of income. And now the last part is that the, the orange figure here is the same national data looked at some other figures. Orange data here is exactly the same numbers we saw on the other page as proportions. But now we're looking at the share of production produced by each of those sectors, the, the categories of farms. So you can see 90% of those farms are only producing not even 25% of the output. Most of the output in the U.S. is generated by those larger sales farms, which you know, makes sense. You can really see, um, it's particularly those large farms with more than a million dollars, 3% of the farms are producing 45% of the output. Um, and so you take all the numbers as a group, about 10% of which is a little over 200,000 farms in the U.S., they produce 77% of the ag production using a, not even half the ag land. You can really look at the upper end. It's 4% of the farms, which is about 85,000 farms in the country, produce over half of the output on just a little bit over 25% of the land. So you can really see it's very concentrated at the upper end. Um, there's a lot of people out there that are farmers that aren't necessarily um, full-time farmers. Okay, so now we're going to switch back into Wisconsin, look at some, you know, how are Wisconsin farmers doing? And one quick measure here I'm looking at is just the dairy farm attrition rate. This is the number of farms that are leaving the industry. Um, it's a month by month, but looking at the at each month, you look back to over the last last year, the last twelve months. What you'll see here here is about it's roughly about four percent, sort of the baseline attrition rate we've been having for a long time. Um, you can see back in twenty sixteen, even early twenty seventeen, and then it started to climb. Um, it hit a peak of about ten percent, a little over actually, in late um, twenty nineteen, early two thousand um, twenty twenty. And then it's been coming down. It's still way above average. It's um, over 6%. Um, but we've, and, um, so it's not as bad as it was, but it's still not good. Um, there's definitely a lot of herds leaving the state. Um, these, the number of farmers that are dairy farmers, our major ag industry is declining at a higher than average rate. And what's also happening is the number of cows is staying relatively constant. And so the average number of cows per herd in the state is gone from 120 to almost 180 here. Um, in just a little less than seven years. And so that's a, almost a 50% increase over that time period just due to the cow number staying the same, but a lot of farmers exiting the industry. The other big news is um, Chapter 12 is, the, is where traditional farmers can file. Not all farmers do or have to, but um, or can actually, but um, we've been leading the nation in Chapter 12 filings for several, um, top, several, a long time, two, three years at least. I've gone way back. And it's quite large here, how high up we are. Um, this has been a persistent trend here in the state. Um, and the other thing I'd like to note is these are over the last 12 months. And so, but the reality is this is, this is about, I'm not quite 70. You go back to these numbers here, these attrition rates, there's roughly 7,000 farms in the state right now. And so, of dairy farms. 
um, these are more than just dairy farms that farm, farm bankruptcies, but that's there's 10% of attrition rate would be roughly 700 farmers leaving in a year. Well, there's only 70 showing up in here as a bankruptcy. There's what I'm trying to say is a lot of farmers are exiting farming or dairy farming, but they're not exiting ag. They're doing other things or um, so only a small proportion of them are leaving farming through foreclosure, being filing bankruptcy. Most of them are just getting out, um, refinancing and extracting themselves from agriculture. Um, the last thing I want to look at here is um, the change in Wisconsin farms. Where are they? Where is this hitting at? We've been seeing a decline in the number of farms and the average size of the farms has been going up. You can see this is just over the last five years, um, 4% decrease in the number of farms in the state according to USDA and almost a 3% increase in the average size. But where all the action is, is in the middle there, the 100 to um, the midsize up to about a million dollars of gross sales. You can see that's where the largest um, decline in number of farms is. It's the, the little, end, little end and the big end is actually lower than the 4% decline. And then the increase in acres. Um, the littlest farms are actually getting smaller, but the bigger ones are getting bigger. But there's really the mid-sized farms, the ones getting bigger. Um, that's where the, the change is. It's in the middle. We're seeing a hollowing out of the middle, and that's where the consolidation is happening. So farmers have been going through some tough years, especially in dairy, but not only, not only dairy. Other crops, other agricultural areas, it's not just dairy that's been through some rough times. We're losing a lot of farms and dairy herds, but not losing a lot of cows. Farming is becoming more consolidated, which is the trend that's been going through for decades. Um, so we're back to farmers in the rural economy communities would really like some good news. Um, and that's the big question we're talking about today in the, in the conference. Is it the bioeconomy or what, how much can the bioeconomy help? 